Tonight we read God's Word from Haggai chapter 1. You remember where Habakkuk is? Turn past that to Zephaniah and past that to the book of Haggai, Haggai chapter 1. Beginning at verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house." Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest with all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger and the Lord's message unto the people saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, in the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, in the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Thus far we read the word of God tonight. May God bless the reading of his word. On the basis of that passage in the whole of Scripture, we consider the instruction of Lord's Day 42, questions and answers 110 and 111. What doth God forbid in the Eighth Commandment? God forbids not only those thefts and robberies which are punishable by the magistrate, but He comprehends under the name of theft all wicked tricks and devices whereby we design to appropriate to ourselves the goods which belong to our neighbor, whether it be by force or under the appearance of right, as by unjust weights, L's, measures, fraudulent merchandise, false coins, usury, or by any other way forbidden by God, as also all covetousness, all abuse and waste of his gifts. But what doth God require in this commandment? that I promote the advantage of my neighbor in every instance I can or may and deal with him as I desire to be dealt with by others. Further also, that I faithfully labor so that I may be able to relieve the needy. 
Thou shalt not steal. These are the words of God in the eighth of the Ten Commandments. This is a commandment that we love. We sing sometimes, How love I thy law. We love the law of God and we love the Eighth Commandment. We ought to consider for a moment the question why. Why ought we to love the Eighth Commandment? We naturally do not like commandments. We naturally react against the idea of someone coming with a commandment telling us, do this or don't do that. But now we hear this Eighth Commandment as the people of God. And in this Eighth Commandment, as in all of the other commandments, we hear God speak to us. And we love this commandment because when our God speaks to us in this commandment, He reveals something of Himself to us. He reveals something about His own being and about His own works. We see the righteousness of God, the goodness and the wisdom of God in His commandments. And we love the Eighth Commandment not only because it tells us thou shalt not steal, but when we consider this commandment and consider it more deeply, we see that the Eighth Commandment shows us in the first place this wonderful reality that God, who is the Creator of all things, is also the owner of all things. And that's something that we need to keep in mind as we apply the Eighth Commandment. Secondly, the Eighth Commandment reveals to us the truth that God loves Himself. All the commandments reveal that, of course. In the law, God requires man to love God and to love the neighbor for God's sake, indicating that God loves Himself. But now in the Eighth Commandment, more specifically, we see this. The purpose of God in creating and in owning all things in heaven and on earth is that all things may serve His glory. God is pleased to glorify Himself in every creature or through every creature He has made. Again, that has significance for us in applying now the Eighth Commandment to our lives. And then thirdly, the Eighth Commandment reveals to us that our God is not only a giving God, but that He is a God who gives generously. And when I say that God gives generously now, we are not to look only upon those who belong to God's church and who are the recipients of His grace. But we may also look at God's work of providence in which He gives many good gifts even to unbelieving and reprobate men and women. Of course we know God does not add His blessing in the giving of those gifts. Nevertheless, we have to conclude that God in His providence is very good and kind even to the wicked. Inasmuch as they don't deserve one crumb of bread. But God gives them more than a crumb. They don't deserve one stitch of clothing, but God gives them more than a stitch of clothing. And many other gifts besides, the wicked ought to say only one thing about God, that He's good, and they ought to thank Him. How much more we who are the recipients of God's grace and who have been reminded once again how generous God is towards us us. He made Christ to be sin for us. He in love gave His only begotten Son for us that rather than that we should die for our sins, 
we might be delivered from the punishment we deserve and become the heirs of everlasting life. Or the Apostle Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that through His poverty ye might be rich. You understand? God is not a God who squeezes together a couple of fingers or squeezes His fist around a rock saying to us, I'm going to squeeze out a couple of drops of salvation for you as my people. But God is a God who opens wide His hand and opens wide His arms to be the fountain of streams of grace and salvation. Or we might say, an ocean of saving benefits to us as His people in Christ Jesus. Now in thanksgiving for the gift of salvation, we are called to do much more than simply not steal by the Eighth Commandment. We are called to love God. We are called to thank God. We are called to reflect God. Imitating Him. And using all of the gifts that He gives to us to glorify His own name. And then also the Eighth Commandment calls us to love God by imitating Him in this too. Not only in that we don't steal, but that we're generous in the giving of our gifts out of gratitude to God. All of this belongs to the subject we consider tonight, that of stewardship. So we consider the Eighth Commandment tonight under this theme, Thankful Stewards of God. We notice three things. Our position, our life, and our gratitude. The Eighth Commandment does reveal to us the principle that God owns everything. God is the owner of of all of the creatures and the things of this world, including you and me, He owns us. He owns all of our talents, all of our abilities, all of our possessions. God is the owner of all things. And our position in this world is not that in which we are owners of anything. Not of ourselves and not of anything that we possess. Our position, and here's the word, our position in this world that God has made is one of a steward. We are stewards of God. What is a steward? Well, first of all, he is not an owner. He owns nothing. Think of the relationship of a business owner and his employee. The business owner who is the the employer, he owns the store. He owns the business. He owns all of the merchandise. All of the assets of the business belong to him. The employee may have many responsibilities. He may have much authority underneath the owner, but he owns nothing in the business. It all belongs to the owner. Well, this creation all belongs to God. And just as the employee is the servant of the employer, so we living here in this world are not the owners of the creation, but we are the servants of God. Secondly, the steward is one who as a servant has a duty to perform, a work that he must perform on behalf of the owner. In a business, an employee is given some authority 
over the owner's merchandise. He may sell some of that merchandise. Perhaps he may buy merchandise on behalf of the owner. Maybe he's even given the company credit card. But in all that that employee does on behalf of the business, he may not at all seek himself. He must seek the good of the owner and his business. We must apply that to ourselves tonight now in the light of the Eighth Commandment. We live in a world that God owns. And God says to us, you may use the creation. God does not say to us that we may not eat bread or meat. He says you may eat bread and if possible, meat. God does not say to us you may not drink the water or the wine of this world. You may drink the water and partake of the wine of this world. And God does not say that money is evil and that you may not have money in this world. God doesn't withhold the creation from us. But we must remember this, that all of the things that we may use in the creation are not to be used as ends in themselves, so that we use them for the pleasure that they give without a thought to God. So that when it comes to eating food, we think of the food and enjoy the food and never think of God, never thank Him. Or so that when it comes to money, we greedily reach out for the money, enjoy the money, and never think of God. And God does not give us these things to use for our own self-enrichment, for our own self-gratification and glory. No. As stewards, we must always use the things of this creation to the glory of God. Thirdly, stewardship means that we must give and account. That's true of employees, isn't it? The employee is always being evaluated by his employer. If he does well, he will be rewarded in various ways. But if he does not do well, if he is lazy, if he embezzles, steals from the company, he will be punished. They are held accountable. We know that. We hear sometimes about employees who embezzle thousands, even millions of dollars from their employers. And then don't you sometimes wonder, what was he or she thinking? Did they really think that they would get away with that? Well, congregation, that's the way we ought to think now as stewards. We need to live in the awareness that we live before the presence of God who owns all things in heaven and on earth, who demands that all things be sanctified for the use of His praise and glory. And we need to live in the awareness that as God watches us, as we live here in this earth, He knows. When we are negligent, when we are wasteful, He knows. When we press the things that He has given to us into the service of our selfish ends and not to the glory of His name. So we need to understand that this stewardship, recognizing that God is the owner, Recognizing that we must serve God in all things. And that we will give an account. This is the opposite of stealing. Do not think tonight that stealing is laziness in the workplace. And then that you have not stolen because you work diligently every day. Do not think that stealing is merely taking something from your neighbor that belongs to him and does not belong to you. And as long as you don't do that, as long as you don't take your neighbor's property for yourself, you're not stealing. But it's stealing. It's robbing God of the glory and the honor He deserves. 
when we do not consciously use all that we are and all that we have for the glory of His name. Where do we find this idea of stewardship in the Bible? Well, maybe when you think of God owning all things, you are already thinking of Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof the world, and they that dwell therein. And maybe you think too of Psalm 50, verse 10, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. And the catechism, the catechism teaches us this truth too, when at the end of the 110th question, It speaks of all abuse and waste of His gifts. You see, when you think of the Eighth Commandment, you must not right away think of loving the neighbor, but you must think right away of your relationship to God. The Catechism recognizes that God gives you some of His gifts. But He does not give those gifts to you and relinquish His ownership. They're still His. How we need to be reminded of that often in our lives. Is it okay for me to speak of my possessions? From a certain point of view, the Eighth Commandment does teach us that we have that right to private property. The Eighth Commandment teaches that I have the right to own property that my neighbor has no right to. And that, on the other hand, the neighbor has the right to own property that I have no right to. I may not take from the neighbor. But when I say, my house, my car, my money, or my wife, or my children, I ought to remember, and you too, two things. One, these are His gifts. He gave them, and He requires them to be used for the glory of His name. Our calling to serve God in the fact that we will have to give account is well established in Scripture. Think of the parable of the talents. Jesus speaks of three men, each given a different amount of talents. And what does Jesus teach? Jesus teaches us that there's accountability in the use of those talents. And when you think of those talents, think of the talents, the abilities that God gives out to His people. Think of the possessions that God gives to His people. Think of all of the opportunities God gives to His people to use their talents and possessions to the glory of His name. And Jesus tells us that the Lord gives those talents And he went away for a little while and then he came back. And then he required his servants to give an account of themselves. Now the point is, not how much have you produced. But the point is this, how have you used the talents, the possessions, the opportunities God has given to you. Jesus doesn't say that the servants are to be commendable because of how much they have produced so that if you think that you have less ability and less to offer than others that somehow you are not faithful And will be looked down upon by the Lord. The Lord doesn't say to the one 
who received more talents and then produced more fruit. Well done, thou more faithful servant. But the point is this. If you've been given two mites only, have you used them to glorify God and His Son, Jesus Christ? Beloved, we are stewards of God. God is absolutely sovereign over us. And one way that we must live before God in the recognition of the fact that we are stewards is to be content. Don't question God. Don't become jealous because God has given one more than He has given to you. And don't be arrogant either. Don't think that because God has given more to you than He's given to another, that means that God favors you more than another. But be content with what God has given you and use that for the glory of His name. Some will produce a hundredfold. Some will produce sixtyfold. Some will produce thirtyfold. Here's the question. Have you been a steward? Have you taken the talents, the possessions, the time, the opportunities God has given you to glorify His name? Let us remember what a gift this is to be a steward of God that we have only through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning, Adam was a steward of God. In the beginning, Adam was placed in the earth to serve God, to have dominion over everything, yes, but not so that he could use the earth to glorify himself, but in order to press the creation into the service of God. God told him to use the creation, to till, and to cultivate the garden for God's glory. But he fell. And the result of that fall of Adam was that he became an enemy of God. And that he began to use the good creation that God had made from the beginning, not for the glory of God, but he used the creation in the service of sin. And after the fall then, we too, we too have come under the power of of sin, so that by nature we are the enemies of God. We live here in this world not as God's friends who have the right to use the creation to the glory of God, but there's a sense in which by nature we are imposters, invaders in the creation. So that every time we use this world, it's as if we are thieves, using the things of this world, our time, our talents, and all of our possessions, not to glorify God, but to rob God of His glory. Christ, Jesus, the Eighth Commandment teaches us, has delivered us from that. He saved us from our sin. God comes to us in the Eighth Commandment as the God who has delivered us from bondage in Egypt, bondage to sin, so that we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. And the Apostle Paul could come to the people in the Ephesian church and come to us in Ephesians 4 verse 28 and say to us, let him that stole steal no more. He can say to us and to the Ephesians, you were children of wrath. You were enemies of God. You could not live for the glory of God. Everything that you did here in this world was in the service to sin. Now you're new creatures in Christ Jesus and you live in this world as God's friends. What applies here are the words of the Apostle Paul in another place. All things are God's. All things are Christ Jesus'. And for His sake, all things are yours. Your 
to use for God's glory. You're stewards of God. His friends called to live for His glory. How? What is to characterize your life? The Apostle Paul points out the negative. Let him that stole steal no more. It's very humbling, isn't it? Once again, here in the Eighth Commandment, God reveals our sin. He reveals the corruption of our sinful hearts. He doesn't come to us and say, you haven't stolen before, now make sure you never do steal. But He comes to us as those who have stolen and He says, stop stealing. You who have stolen, steal no more. It's not only Adam and Eve in the beginning who were guilty of stealing. God had said, didn't He? All the trees, all the trees in the garden are yours. You may enjoy the fruit. There's one that's mine. and You may not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in addition to their pride, in addition to all of the other sins that Adam and Eve committed in the beginning, they committed sin against the Eighth Commandment. Eve took the fruit God had forbidden. And then when she gave it to Adam, Adam became guilty of taking and eating the fruit God had forbidden taking what didn't belong to them. That's our original guilt and sin. But we're not going to say, are we, that we're not guilty of this ourselves, of having covetous hearts that reach out for things that don't belong to us, we can see it. We can see it in our children, can't we? We can see it in not the world's children, but in the children of believers, the children of the covenant. We see that this sin grips their hearts when they are in a room full of toys with a brother or sister or another child. And you can say to that child, you may have every toy in the room to play with, except for the one that the other child has. And what do our children do? They reach out for the neighbor's toy to steal it. Beloved, that's the sin, the power of this sin over the hearts of our children and over our hearts. And God comes and He says, Steal no more. Love me. Love me as the God who has saved you from this sin through Jesus Christ. Submit to my sovereignty over you as the one who owns all things and who gives you all things and do not steal. Now the Heidelberg Catechism teaches us especially how this commandment governs our lives in relationship to the neighbor. But let us remember that this also governs our lives in relationship to God. And that that's where we need to start as stewards. When the commandment comes to us and says, do not steal, let him that stole steal no more, we ought to think about our relationship to God and what this requires of us. And this requires of us that we seek God and His kingdom first. That was the trouble with the people of Judah, wasn't it? Haggai the prophet had to go to them not to condemn them for taking from the neighbor that which didn't belong to them, 
But he had to go to them at a time after the return from captivity in Babylon, after the people had built the foundation of the temple. But then, partially for selfish reasons, they quit building the temple. And the Lord has to come to them in verse 4 and say, Is this the time for you to live in sealed houses? You have homes that are finished. You have homes with walls and with ceilings and with roofs. You live in beautiful homes. And what does the house of God look like now? The house of God is just a bare floor. And God comes to the people of Judah saying, really in a sense, you've broken the Eighth Commandment. Instead of seeking me and my kingdom first, you've lived for yourself. Now go and build the house of God. So we need to avoid the sin of Judah and failing to prioritize things in our lives, remembering that God and His kingdom comes first. Remembering and then teaching our children that too in the way that we live when we receive a paycheck, even that first paycheck. First, we must remember the giving the giving that is required of us to God's kingdom to support the preaching of the gospel. Remembering not only what God teaches us here in Haggai 1, but also what Elijah the prophet taught the widow of Zarephath. When there she was, all alone with her son, ready to make one last meal and die. And the prophet Elijah says to her, go ahead, make that meal, feed yourselves. But he says, you feed me, the prophet, You feed me first. That we are stewards must characterize our lives in this way. That we seek the kingdom of heaven before everything else. But then, when we say that we need to have our priorities straight, that we must serve God as stewards and seek the kingdom of heaven first, don't apply that this way. That means that I may divide things up in my life. There are things that are God's, and those are the first fruits, and then there are things that are mine. No. In the Eighth Commandment, we're reminded that everything is God's, and that we are to live that way. Not only that portion of our money and possessions that we use to support the church, to give to the poor, to support the Christian schools, but also the money that I use to buy a car, to go on a vacation. Everything that I do as a steward must be for God and nothing for me. That doesn't mean that as a steward, God never gives one the ability to enjoy the luxuries of this life. But it does mean that if God does give that ability, that the one who will enjoy life's luxuries must take God into account and be able to say, I may do this. I may do this. And yet glorify God. Living as a steward, not stealing from God, is what the catechism has in mind, I remind you, when it speaks of all abuse and waste of His gift. This means that God requires of you and me work in the Eighth Commandment. Hard work. Diligent work. We as the people of God are told in the Eighth Commandment that we may not seek to obtain things by stealing or by any other illegitimate means, by relying upon the social welfare programs of the government, The Eighth Commandment says, work 
in the sweat of your face, God is pleased to give you what He will to support your life here on this earth. We must serve God, not steal from Him. And we must love the neighbor and not steal from Him. The catechism is quite detailed here. The catechism condemns all outright thefts in which we take the things that belong to the neighbor for ourselves. The catechism also condemns any trick, any clever form of stealing from the neighbor where the neighbor may not even know that you have stolen from him. And the catechism focuses on tricks used in the world of business. Unjust weights, owls, measures, fraudulent merchandise, false coins, and usury. And the catechism says, as a steward of God, you must love the neighbor and never take advantage. As a steward of God, it's sin against God to defraud the government. It's sin against God to sign a fraudulent tax form, even if the government never catches you. It's sin against God to lie and to steal and to cheat in one's business dealings, to defraud the neighbor without the neighbor maybe even knowing it by using an unjust weight or measurement or by using some form of false advertisement. It's sin against God, children to take answers that don't belong to you in school or in catechism. And maybe your neighbor won't know that you took his answers. Maybe the teacher won't know that you took the answer. But you know as a steward now that you will be held accountable by God. You may not steal in any way in gross outright stealing, or in clever little tricks and devices. That ought not characterize the life of the child of God who is a steward of God. The catechism adds to that this. You may not steal from the neighbor, but you must use every opportunity to help or promote the neighbor's good. Do you understand that if God has given you two coats and your neighbor has none, that God considers it stealing if you will not give your neighbor one of your coats? Do you understand that if God has given you cupboards full of food and a table full of extra food, and your neighbor has no food, he considers it stealing. If you won't give to the neighbor any food. Oh yes, ordinarily God is pleased to give to his people and provide for their needs through work. But the catechism reminds us here that there are always poor. The poor even in God's kingdom. And that God is pleased to provide for those people sometimes not through work, because they don't have the ability to work, they don't have the opportunity to work, but God doesn't leave them without the provision of their daily needs. God is pleased to provide for them through the generosity of His church. As a steward, if you see the need of the neighbor you have the ability, you have the opportunity to help. The Eighth Commandment requires you in love for God and in love for the neighbor to help as much as you are able. I understand, people of God, that the Eighth Commandment doesn't come to you tonight to make you feel guilty the Eighth Commandment doesn't come to you only to expose all of your sin and show you how you have fallen short in your duty to be a faithful steward of God. 
But rather the Eighth Commandment comes to you telling you to be grateful. Be thankful to God. Be thankful to God who has given His Son to the death of the cross to deliver you from your sin. Be thankful to God for the fact that His Son was crucified in between two thieves. Be thankful to God that His Son prayed for one of those thieves that He would be forgiven. Be thankful to God that Jesus gave His life for that thief and for all of His people who are guilty of sin against the Eighth Commandment. And then hear God say now in the Eighth Commandment, I've delivered you from this sin. Now thank me by serving me as stewards. And that means especially two things. Take these two things with you as you go out tonight. Thankful for salvation through Jesus Christ. One, work hard. Look at all of the talents and the gifts and the possessions God has given you. And say to yourself, this is my duty. My duty is to use these things for the glory of God. And then secondly, give. And give generously. Think about what God has given for you and for your salvation and respond in the use of your time and talents and money in a way that is appropriate. And don't let God look down upon you this way. Here's a person who doesn't really seem to be thankful for the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life. Because he never has time for the church. He never has a dime for the offering plate. He doesn't think that he needs to do anything to serve the kingdom. But rather let your attitude be this. That when God looks down upon you, he says, Ah, there's a man there's a woman who understands how freely, how graciously I gave my son to forgive their sins. Let God see it in your attitude and in your use of the generous gifts and talents and possessions He's given you as you give for His kingdom. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy Word. Work this Word into our hearts for our comfort, but also for our instruction. That we may apply it to our lives. And that we may use it to teach the children to of our position here in this world as the owners of nothing but as the stewards required to use all things to the glory of thy name. This is the least we can do out of gratitude for the great gift of thy Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.